In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the history of goalie masks and showcase some of the most unique designs. And while it's hard to talk about goalie masks without talking about paint jobs, that won't be the focus of this video. We're going to be looking at the gear itself and show the spectrum of gear. And if you love goalie gear and goalie masks, be sure to check out the Sport Antic t-shirt shop for some incredible designs based off of your favorite goalie masks. There's no better place to start this video than from the beginning. In the early days of hockey, goalies started off like any other skater on the ice, without special equipment. The goals of early hockey didn't even have netting on them. As the sport became more and more popular, the game got more serious. Goalies began wearing specialized equipment, like cricket-like pads for the legs and gloves with extra padding. But most serious players didn't see protective gear for the face to be as important early on. The very first documented case of a goalie wearing facial protection that I can find was from 1899. In this year, we can see that Frontenac's goalie, Edgar Hiscock, wore a baseball catcher's mask to protect his nose that was broken in an earlier game. In the same year, we see that goalie Everett Marshall also wore a baseball catcher's mask in a game in 1899. Everett Marshall was using a baseball mask to protect his eye, as he already lost an eye in a previous game due to a stick hitting him in the face. Despite these risks, most goalies of the time did not wear any facial protection. Facial protection was not at the top of people's minds since there were not a lot of rising shots being taken. So while many goalies playing hockey probably didn't feel the need to wear facial protection at this time, there are documented examples of early goalies wearing the baseball catcher's mask in games. Just take a look at some of these documented examples. Despite all these earlier examples, goalie Elizabeth Graham is often credited as being the first goalie to wear a mask when she put on a fencing mask playing for the Queen's University women's hockey team in 1927, primarily to protect her teeth. We really don't know what her fencing mask looked like, but here's an example of one made in the 1920s. In competitive hockey, coaches didn't want their goalies to wear anything that would block their goalie's vision, and would consider any goalie that wanted to wear a mask to be lacking courage. The next well-documented case of a goalie wearing a mask happened in 1930. Goalie Clint Benedict, who was known for often dropping down to the ice to make saves, took several shots to the head, including one from Howie Moran's that broke his nose, cheekbone, and knocked him unconscious. When he came back six weeks later, he was wearing the NHL's first goalie mask. What looked to be primarily a football face guard was strapped to his face. Benedict wore the mask for maybe five more games, but blamed the mask for blocking his vision. At the end of the same season, Howie Morantz took a shot that hit Benedict in the throat, which essentially ended his career, and the mask was not seen again in the NHL for many decades to come. Outside of the NHL, there were a few goalies here and there that experimented with different types of masks. In 1915, Boston AA goaltender Ollie Chadwick was known to wear some sort of eye coverings while playing. From this newspaper caricature, we can see that the goggles that he wore looked like they could have been aviator goggles from the time. Another type of mask that was used during this time was a wire mask similar to a catcher's mask that protected just the eyes. Some of these were marketed as field lacrosse eye protectors, and some companies advertised them as glasses protectors. In 1920, the goalie for the Exeter Academy, Bill Cantillon, wore this type of wire protector that covered his eyes, and also what looks to be a pair of eyeglasses that he seems to be wearing. In 1921, Princeton goaltender and team captain Gene Maxwell also wore a wire face protector that covered just his eyes. But he wasn't the only one on his team wearing this type of mask. His teammate, defenseman E.W. Gould, also wore the eye protection mask. In 1930, we see Roy Musgrove wearing the wire face protector while playing for the University of Manitoba in the Winnipeg Junior League. Then again in the late 30s, when in England playing in the British League for the Wembley Lions. In the 1932 Olympics, Team USA goalie Franklin Farrell wore the eye protection mask. He played all six games for Team USA that year, which won the silver medal after being bested by Team Canada for the gold. One of the more widely documented examples of a goalie wearing a mask came in 1936 during the Olympics, when Japanese goalie Taiji Hamna wore a special mask similar to a baseball catcher's mask. The mask had round eye loops that matched the shape of his eyeglasses that he wore while playing. In the late 1940s, a goalie named Don Whiston, who played for the Brown University Bears, took a puck to the mouth which pushed his teeth out of alignment. After team doctor George Edward Crane wired his teeth back into place, he began to look for a way to protect his face without blocking his vision. What he found was a company that made football face masks out of many different materials, including plastics. So the doctor drew up and sent in a mask design and was sent back a plastic face guard that covered the cheeks, nose, mouth, and chin, but left his eyes unobstructed 
just as the doctor had designed. Whiston became the first collegiate goalie to wear a mask, and helped him to win MVP honors in 1951. In the NHL, goalies were still not wearing masks in games. However, it was a little known secret that the goalies of the time were wearing masks in practice, and had been doing so for a while. While many coaches didn't want their goalies to wear anything that could potentially block their vision in a game, most were okay with a mask in practice. One of the masks that was used in practice was the louche mask. Known as the head saver, or face protector, the mask was a clear plastic shield with padding and somewhat resembled a welder's mask, but with slots cut out for breathing. It came in several configurations and was used by multiple NHL goalies in practice. Here we can see Johnny Bauer wearing the mask in 1956. Here we can see Glenn Hall with the mask. And even Jacques Plant had a version of the mask that he heavily modified with eye holes and extra padding. But the first goalie mask didn't see game action until November of 1959, when Canadian's goaltender Jacques Plant was hit in the face from a puck off the stick of Rangers player Andy Bathgate. Plant was taken into the locker room for stitches and refused to come back on the ice without the mask he had been using in practice lately. The mask was a fiberglass mask made custom by Bill Birchmore from a mold of Jacques Plant's face. The mask weighed just under a pound and was 3 16 of an inch thick. Plant's coach, Toe Blake, reluctantly agreed to let him play in the game with the mask. Plant went undefeated for his next 18 games and proved that the protection and confidence that the mask provide outweigh any vision issues. In 1962, another NHL star began wearing a mask, but this time it wasn't a goalie insisting on wearing a mask, but management insisting that their goalie wear one. Detroit Red Wings manager Jack Adams was tired of seeing his star goalie Terry Sawchuck get injured. So the Red Wings provided Sawchuck with a mask that was originally made for minor league prospect Dennis Riggin by Red Wings trainer Lefty Wilson to wear in games. After Sawchuck began wearing the mask, it finally started to become a mainstay in the hockey world. So the cloud around the goalie mask began to lift. With goalie mask being such a new concept, the services of Bill Birchmore, who made Plant's mask, and Lefty Wilson, who made Sawchuck's mask, were in high demand. Soon after making Plant's original mask, Birchmore changed his technique and was no longer using sheets of fiberglass to make a mask, but was now using fiberglass yarn, which was easier to contour to the face and allowed him to make protective masks that were lighter and allowed for more airflow. This style of mask began to be known as the pretzel mask for its likeness to a large pretzel. Plant even began to wear the new pretzel mask, but the mask made by Lefty Wilson and other mask makers that started to pop up were mostly using masks with sheets of fiberglass and just cut holes out for vision and air circulation. One of the unique masks that came out from this time was a mask that was part pretzel mask and part standard mask, which was made for Ken Dryden by Birchmore while he was a goalie for Cornell University. Several years later, Dryden brought back this mask for some games in the NHL with the Canadians. As demand rose for new custom masks to be made, more people tried their hand at mask making, including former plumber Ernie Higgins, who made his first mask for his goaltending son, Neil. Ernie Higgins' biggest contribution to the art of mask making was making the mask rounder to cover more of the face, which not only protected the face more, but also stopped the masks from moving around as much, which were problems for the early pretzel masks and the earlier flatter Lefty Wilson masks. By the early 70s, most of the masks being ordered in the NHL were the newer, rounder masks that covered more of the face from Ernie Higgins. However, the landscape for facial protection was far from settled during this time. Goalies that did wear masks could choose to wear a simple fiberglass mask, a pretzel style mask, a mask that combined these two styles of mask, the larger round or Higgins mask, and at this time there were still goalies that didn't wear a mask at all. While in North America, protection came down to a player's choice, many international leagues and tournaments passed rules that required every player to wear either a helmet or a mask. This led to some bizarre options being worn in international tournaments. In 1971, Swedish goaltender Kurt Larsson chose to wear just a helmet rather than opt for a goalie mask. As you can imagine, this left him quite vulnerable. In 1972, Kurt opted to add a barely there mask to go with his helmet. And as you can see, it didn't offer much protection, and a shot to the face would be dangerous, though it's better than nothing. Also in 1972, North Americans got a chance to see Vladislav Treciak wear his helmet-cage combination and with great results. Take a look at this Cooper catalog from 1972. They tried to sell a little bit of everything to amateur goalies. 
In 1973, we started to see more styles of helmet and cage combinations get used internationally, but these early helmet-cage combinations were not without flaws. Many of the helmets of the time used soft plastics, and most cages did not offer any protection to the ears. While the vision and airflow may be nice, the security of a full fiberglass mask was tried and true. By 1975, however, Tretiak wore a helmet-cage combination that was well ahead of its time. He wore a Cooper SK600, which used a heavier-duty plastic than most helmets of the time that aimed to be comfortable and lightweight, and paired it with a Cooper HM30 cage, which was a wire cage with a cat-eye design that offered great vision, but still would not let a puck through the mask. The HM30 also extended back to the ears and provided protection there as well. During the mid-70s, we did see a few other interesting goalie setups get experimented with, including combining a full goalie mask with a hockey helmet. But for the next five or so years, it would still be the fiberglass mask that was the choice for most elite goalies in the NHL. Even Kurt Larsson, the Swedish goalie that played with just a helmet, switched to a full fiberglass mask when he moved to play professional hockey in North America. Fiberglass masks also made a jump in their quality during this time. Not only did the masks now cover more of the face and wrap around better, but they also started to incorporate strategically placed ridges that would deflect the puck's energy instead of taking the full brunt of a puck's force. Mask making also became a big business, and masks began to be mass produced. Jacques Plante, the original mask wearing NHL goalie himself, got into the business of selling goalie masks on a mass scale with Fibrosport. Fibrosport alone was cranking out 8,000 masks a year. Other mask makers, like Michel Lefebvre, added new innovations, like long extensions to protect the neck area as well. But it wasn't just mask makers making big innovations to the goalie mask. The goalies themselves left their marks on their masks as well. The first goalie to wear a mask that had been custom decorated was Bruins goalie Jerry Cheevers. One day in practice, after taking a shot up high, Cheevers pretended to be hurt from the shot so he could get out of practice. He left the ice and entered the locker room to relax. The story goes that Bruins coach Harry Sinden came in and saw Cheevers relaxing with a cigarette while looking over the horse racing odds and immediately forced him back on the ice. The rest of the Bruins team got a big laugh out of the fact that Cheevers had gotten caught. For added laughs, Bruins trainer Frosty Forrestal drew on a 10-stitch wound in the area that the soft shot had hit Cheevers in practice. From that day on, Cheevers added a stitch to his mask any time he took a shot up high. And you can see over time, the number of stitches increased throughout his career. Doug Favell experimented with several simple paint jobs for his masks in the 70s, but the first intricate custom paint job designed in the NHL was another accident. When Penguins goalie Jim Rutherford was traded to the Red Wings, he knew his solid blue mask would not fit in with his new team's colors. So he asked mask maker Greg Harrison to paint it white. When he got the mask back, he found that it was not only white, but included red wings above the eyes. This is not what Rutherford wanted or asked for, but it was too late to have it changed now. He needed it right away. But the mask was a hit with fans, and before long, goalies across the league were painting their masks to match their team. A few goalies stepped it up and added intricate designs that were more of a personal statement that had almost nothing to do with the team that they played on. By the mid-70s, nearly every goalie was now wearing a mask of some sort. The very last holdout was Penguins goalie Andy Brown, whom never played a game with a mask. His last game in the NHL was on April 7, 1974. But this was only his last NHL game. Andy left the NHL to play for the WHA, a competitor to the NHL that was paying players more money in many cases. And Andy continued to play without a mask until 1977 when he finally retired from the WHA. Even though fiberglass masks had improved over time, they were still not keeping up with the increasing firepower of shooters. In the 1960s, several players like Stan Mikita and Bobby Hall began experimenting with curved stick blades, which dramatically increased the speed of a shot. Players began relying on the slap shot more, and stick manufacturers were incorporating fiberglass into hockey sticks, all of which meant more injuries for goalies. The fiberglass masks required the eyes to be close to the eye holes to have a clear view. Because of this, eye injuries were increasingly more common, even with the use of the best fiberglass masks. What goalies began to understand was that the helmet-cage combinations, like the one worn by USSR's Vladislav Tretiak, were protecting goalies better than the fiberglass masks. Throughout the late 70s, we saw goalies making the switch from the fiberglass mask to the full cage. The first goalie to do so in the NHL was Gilles Graton. 
Other goalies like Billy Smith joined him in switching over in the late 70s, and some of the new goalies coming into the league played their first games with the helmet-cage combination. Even though it was looking like the cage-helmet combination was the safest setup, not everyone was in a hurry to switch over. Many goalies were used to their masks and didn't want to change up what was working for them. It could also be an adjustment to look through the bars of a cage. Tony Esposito took a unique approach. In 1976, he added a modified wire cage on top of his existing fiberglass mask to help reinforce the eye section of the mask. While some goalies were making adjustments for added safety, most just continued with what they were used to. In 1977, a shot hit Sabres goalie Jerry Desjardins in the eye area of his mask, which injured his eye. The injury required surgery and ended Desjardins' goaltending career. Goalie Dave Dryden, the older brother of Canadian's great Ken Dryden, knew that the cage helmet setups were the safest, but had a hard time making the transition. He really liked the snug way the top of his mask rested against the top of his head, and the way the backplate kept things snug. He didn't like the feel that most helmets had when strapped to his head, so he teamed with mask maker Greg Harrison to design a special goalie mask that had a forehead and chin section with a backplate keeping things snug, but with an eye area redone so it could be fitted with a cage that stayed far away from the eyes. And in 1977, Dave Dryden had a fiberglass mask, custom built, with a modified cat eye helmet cage attached to it. This fiberglass slash cage combination mask is considered the first modern style of goalie mask, but it did not immediately catch on across the NHL. Many goalies still wore their traditional fiberglass masks, even after Desjardins' injury. However, in 1979, a stick swung up and hit Flyers goalie Bernie Perrant in the eye. This injury ended his goaltending career. This started a trend of goalies to leave behind their fiberglass masks in favor of cage helmet setups. The early 80s was the era of the helmet cage goalie. There were still goalies using old fiberglass masks in the early 80s, but they were quickly transitioning into the cage helmet setups. There are many different types of helmet cage combinations that a goalie could choose from for their setup. One of the earliest trends included using Jofa helmets in cages, as they had been doing so for years in Europe. Early NHL cage wearers like Don Edwards, Gilles Cretan, Bob Sauvé, Richard Brodeur, and Ron Lowe amongst others all wore Jofa setups. One helmet that was tried out in the NHL as a potential goalie helmet was the CCM HT2 helmet. It was a common helmet already in the NHL for skaters, so getting one was easy, but the HT2 had a couple of flaws for goalie use. There was a section that the CCM logo was printed on that was flat, and if a puck hit you there, all of the energy of the puck was pushed back into the goalie's head. Also, the air vents on the right or left of the logo were very thin strips of plastic and could easily be broken by a shot. Then, many goalies discovered that the Cooper SK600 matched with the Cooper HM30 cage offered decent protection with great visibility. This is the setup that Vladislav Tretiak had been wearing for years. The SK600 was lightweight, durable, and easily available, but it also suffered from having a flat section in the middle of the helmet that the Cooper logo sat in, even if it sat at a better angle than the CCM. But the ultimate helmet for goalies that chose to wear a helmet-cage combo proved to be the Cooper SK2000. The most popular mask to be paired with the SK2000 was the Cooper HM30. Many goalies wore this exact setup, but there were some other combinations. Some paired it with the HM50 grid-style mask, like John Van Beesbrook, Dominic Hasek, and Martin Prusik. One of the oddest SK2000 combinations ever seen was worn by Andy Moog in the 1988 Olympics. After wearing his pro-style mask for a game or two, the Olympic Committee came into Team Canada's locker room to inform them that Moog's pro-style cat-eye cage was against Olympic rules and needed to be replaced with a cage with smaller openings. So the team dug up an SK2000 helmet, but Moog chose to pair it with a full bubble shield instead of a traditional cage like an HM50. This combination never caught on, and for good reason. These masks could fog up with a lot of heat. Definitely not ideal for a goalie. They could also leave puck marks if a puck hit them in the mask, if the mask doesn't crack, which is known to happen with hard direct shots. Paired with the fact that even little nicks, light glares, and distortions can cause visual impairments meant that this setup was never meant to see extensive use for goalies. But the Cooper SK2000 was not the only helmet used for goalies, even if it was the most popular. Artur's Ear Bay was known for wearing a Jofa 280 helmet with a Jofa 262 cage. Tommy Soderstrom was known for wearing a Jofa 290 helmet with a large Jofa 278 cage. In the 2010 Olympics, Swiss goalie Florence Schelling wore a Jofa 390 helmet with a Jofa 387 cage. 
Another thing that was unique about the helmet cage combos was the accessories that could be attached to them. There were throat protectors that dangled underneath a cage to protect the vulnerable neck area, like the Cooper TP. Martin Prusik was known to wear one of these with his SK2000 HM50 helmet cage combo. For a more stationary neck protection, there was the iTech N6 throat guard, which attached to the cage wires themselves and was worn by goalies like Kelly Rudy with his Jofa 280 Jofa 262 combo. There were all sorts of other add-ons that you could attach to a standard helmet cage combo to make it look a little bit more like the new style of mask that Dave Dryden introduced. Jofa had a lot of neat add-ons like this, but none of them really took off. There were a few international games played with these types of add-ons on some European goalies in the 80s though. But around the same time that helmet cage combos became popular, Dave Dryden's mask design also started to gain ground for being a superior protective mask. Established goalies that spent time experimenting with different setups went to the new style of mask, like Chico Resch. Young goalies like Patrick Waugh began entering the league with the new style of mask as their default mask. By the late 80s, nearly all goalies had ditched the old form-fitting fiberglass masks in favor of either a helmet cage combo or what we would now call a modern style mask. The last goalie to cling on to their old form-fitting fiberglass mask was Sam St. Laurent, who put on the mask for the last time in the NHL in 1990. As more and more goalies tried the modern style of mask, more goalies fell in love with the protection it provided, especially in the butterfly technique which demands that the goalie continuously drop their heads down into shot range. Many goalies that did switch from the form-fitting fiberglass masks to the helmet cage combinations were now switching to this new mask design. One decision that a goalie needed to make was what style of cage they wanted on their mask. While it might not be immediately evident, there are actually several different styles of cages that can be attached to a mask. The most common cage in the NHL is the Pro Cat Eye. The Cat Eye cage is designed to give the goalies large areas around the eyes that are unobstructed, so that the goalie can view the game without having to look through bars. The design is based around the Cooper HM30 that was attached to helmets, first introduced in the 70s. The bars are still close enough together that a puck can't fit between even the largest opening. However, that doesn't mean that nothing can get through. Stick blades can, and do, sneak their way through the openings of a cat eye cage. So while the cat eye cage offers the best visibility, it offers the most opportunities for injury. In the NHL, this is by far the most popular cage type attached to pro goalie masks. For goalies that want full protection, we have the certified cage. A certified cage is a grid-like pattern that will not only prevent any pucks or stick blades from getting through, but they are also designed so that even if a stick blade breaks at its thinnest part of the blade, it would still not be able to fit through. At their skinniest section, a stick blade must be at least 2 inches, so even in a disaster situation where a blade breaks off at its thinnest part, the goalie is still protected from flying blades. In the NHL, we have seen goalies like John Van Bees, Rook, Kelly Rudy, and Drew McIntyre wear the certified cage. In lower levels of hockey, goalies are required to wear cages that have been certified. So in more recent years, when emergency backup goalies have been called up to play in a game, a good number of them have come into games wearing certified cages on their masks. There is another cage type that's almost a mix between the cat eye and the certified cage. It's called the cheater. While it's called the cheater, it's completely legal in the NHL. The cheater cage is another grid style pattern cage, but the cheater cage has its largest openings around the eyes, which are larger than the openings of a certified cage. While cheater cages are not regulated, many of them have grid patterns tight enough to block out stick blades and pucks, but would not be able to protect a goalie if a stick blade was broken off at its smallest section. NHL goalies that have worn the cheater cage include Don Prey, Mike Liu, Rick Walmsley, Curtis McElhaney, Tim Thomas, and Drew McIntyre. Don Prey's son, Connor, also appeared to wear one that looked strikingly similar to his dad's when he was called up as an emergency backup goalie to the Minnesota Wild. Recently, a new variation of the cat eye cage was introduced to the NHL by goalie Jonas Hiller. It's sometimes known as the open mouth cat eye cage. It's identical to the cat eye cage around the eyes of the goalie, but down by the mouth, a long curved bar has been removed and replaced with two smaller bars. This not only is reportedly giving goalies a better view when looking straight down, but it actually does a better job of keeping out stick blades from entering the lower section of the mask. It is a more expensive style of cage and more complex to manufacture, but I could see this style of cage catching on in the future. I have already seen it being used in local rinks by amateurs in my area. Another unique cage was used in the Swiss leagues by goalie Marco Strait that's very intriguing to me. A traditional cat eye cage is composed of a series of bars that are welded together. This hexagonal grill is actually one solid piece of stainless steel that is cut into the pattern that you see here. Theoretically, this should make it stronger. 
I also like the way that the cage looks a bit like Teji Hamna's mask from the 1936 Olympics. One other style of cage worth mentioning is the certified cat eye, which is a mask that somewhat has a cat eye look, but also meets the requirements to be listed as a certified cage. No goalie has ever worn this in the NHL. By the 2000s, the modern mask was by far the most popular setup in the NHL, with only a handful of goalies still wearing the helmet cage combos. But the combos were not quite dead yet. Even in the 2000s, some of the young goalies coming into the league entered in wearing a helmet cage combo. The modern style of masks are seen as more protective from a shot, so why would anyone still be using the old helmet cage combos? Well, there's actually several reasons why some of the goalies held on to their helmet cage combos, aside from it just being what they're used to. Helmet cage combos typically don't have a back plate and are strapped to the head securely. This means that a helmet is less likely to come off your head in the middle of play. And contrary to popular belief, if a goalie's helmet comes off in the middle of play, the play does not automatically get whistled dead in the NHL. As long as the refs determine that there is a potential imminent scoring opportunity, they are to let the play continue on. There even appears to be some NHL goalies that don't know about this rule, have we seen examples from Alex Delac, as well as an example from Louis Domingue, where they've intentionally taken off their masks in order to get a stoppage. Before you get too angry with these goalies for being poor sports, what appears to have happened in both cases is contact from a puck or player approximately where the lower backplate strap connects. We can even see a puck mark on Stalock's backplate strap. If this becomes undone or is blown due to a shot, the whole mass becomes completely unstable, will wobble out of place, potentially blocking the goalie's vision and could slip off at any time. What these goalies could have been doing is taking off their mask to make it obvious to the refs that their straps blew and needed a stoppage. I'll let you decide for yourselves. But with a helmet cage combo, the straps typically don't blow off like this, and even if a goalie does lose a strap, the helmet typically fits snugly enough so that it wouldn't come off even if they are missing a strap. Helmet cage combos are less likely to come off due to contact as well. While the number of goalies that wore helmet cage combos steadily decreased, those that did wear them benefited from some improvements in materials that those in modern masks had already enjoyed for years. One of the weaknesses with the SK2000s, like the one Hasek wore, were the side bumpers that protect the adjustment area of the helmet. These could be blown off the helmet with a shot. The bumpers along with the rest of the helmet is made from plastic. By the 2000s, Hasek was having his helmets made by companies like Warwick and Ray, which use modern composite materials for their helmets. The newer helmets did not need to have bumpers, since they were not designed to be adjustable, but rather custom made to each player. The composite helmets also made it possible to airbrush these helmets with beautiful results. Some of the goalies tried getting paint jobs on their older plastic helmets, but they never seemed to come out right. There was even an instance where a goalie went from a modern mask to a helmet cage combo. Rick DiPietro was the first overall pick by the Islanders in 2000. And on February 2nd of 2011, DiPietro was in a fight, if you want to call it that, with Brent Johnson. And DiPietro had to leave the ice with a broken jaw. Because of his healing and sensitive jaw, when DiPietro came back later that year, he came back wearing an SK2000 HM30 combo that Chris Osgood had worn when he was with the Islanders. The chin sling on the HM30 allowed him to rest his chin on the pad, which was more comfortable for him as his jaw healed. The 2000s also saw the introduction of the Mage Mask, which was part modern goalie mask, part helmet cage combo. It's somewhat similar to a modern goalie mask, but with the bottom section cut out, and an oversized cage with the goalie's choice of a chin rest. Tim Thomas was known for wearing this setup for a good period of time while in the NHL. By the 2010s, many of the goalies that wore helmet cage combos were retiring. The last year that a goalie wore a helmet cage combo in the NHL was in 2014. There was an instance where the Sabres needed an emergency goalie to serve as backup after Michael Neuverth went down with an injury, so they turned to their goalie coach, 47-year-old Artiers Irbe, to be their backup for the last two periods. While he never needed to come on the ice, the Sabres did scramble to put together a helmet cage combo to his liking in case he did need to come into the game. Also in 2014, Tim Thomas entered a game for the Florida Panthers with an SK600 clone made from modern materials by Olympia Composites and an iTech N6 throat protector. Unfortunately, the cage that he paired it with was a standard player's cage, so when he took a shot right off the face in the first period, the cage part of his combo bent in and he finished the game with a mage mask. That was the last time a helmet cage combo saw action on the ice in the NHL. After 2014, no more helmet cage combos would be seen in the NHL, though one did make an appearance in the 2019 KHL skills competition. 
While the modern style of mask may have gotten its start with Dave Dryden's original design, masks have come a long way since the late 70s, as they're now available in lighter weight and sturdier composite materials, but can still hold on to a paint job as well as any time before. My favorite paint jobs on modern goalie masks are the ones that pay homage to the older goalie masks throughout history, especially when a modern mask is painted to look like an older setup. Aside from that, I think simple paint jobs with large features look the best on modern goalie masks. A lot of modern paint jobs have small little details that are hard to see from a distance, almost like a game of Where's Waldo with a goalie mask, which means that most fans won't be able to see what's going on, which is a shame because a lot of them have some really cool features. So I feel like large simple themes are what works best. The impact of the goalie mask extends beyond the sport of ice hockey. In the old days of hockey, we saw goalies take inspiration from baseball with some of the equipment that pioneer goalies were using. But today, it is baseball that has taken inspiration from hockey, as modern catcher's masks are made in hockey styles, which are more protective than the traditional catcher's masks. But what does the future hold? While no one can predict the future, perhaps the future of goalie masks can come in improving the cages on the mask. Sergei Singh is a mechanical engineer who worked on spaceships for Virgin Galactic. Sergian saw the potential of using Dyneema fiber, which is also used in bulletproof vests, to build a prototype that was strong, yet blocked less of a goalie's vision. Right now, his cage is still in the testing phase, but this concept could develop into some serious advancements. I hope you enjoyed this history of goalie masks. What was your favorite style of goalie mask? Consider taking a look at the t-shirt shop and represent the style of goalie mask that you like best. Or, if you have a goalie in your life that you'd like to say thank you to, consider saying thank you with a t-shirt that matches their equipment.